Welcome to Editor's Choice, Latin American Perspectives Book Conversations. My name is Alexander Scott. I am the Outreach Coordinator for Latin American Perspectives and a member of the Editorial Collective. My name is Tomas Crowder Taraborelli, and I'm a member of the Editorial Collective and co-editor of the Media and Film section. For today's episode, we are very excited to be joined by Francesca Lessa. Francesca holds a PhD in International Relations from the London School of Economics, and from the fall of 2011 to 2023, she held various positions at the University of Oxford as a postdoctoral researcher and later as a departmental lecturer in Latin American Studies. In September of 2023, she joined the Institute of the Americas at the University College of London as an associate professor in International Relations of the Americas. Her research specializes in human rights in Latin America, focusing on accountability for past and present instances of human rights violations and the politics behind these processes, which encompass state, regional, and international actors, as well as civil society activists. Today, we will be discussing Francesca's new book, The Condor Trials, Transnational Repression and Human Rights in South America, which was just published by Yale University Press in 2022. The focus of the work is on the notorious Operation Condor, which was a secret repressive network created in 1975. The book focuses on the phenomenon of transnational collaboration intelligence sharing, concentration camps, extermination methods, mass arrests, torture, transportation of detainees, and abductions. Francesca, welcome to Editor's Choice. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to join. Congratulations on your book. Um, it's We really enjoyed reading it, and we learned a lot, of course. And um, Francesca, what urged you to write this book? When did your interest arise in the topic of human rights abuses and the prosecution of perpetrators? So I had been working on issues of impunity and accountability in the Southern Cone, for my PhD. And at the time I was focusing specifically on the uh, cases of Argentina and Uruguay and trying to understand the ways in which these two countries had come to terms with the legacy of the atrocities committed at the time of their regimes. And as I was doing that first project, I had encountered the topic of Operation Condor, but I didn't really have the chance to analyze it in depth because I was already uh, focusing on these uh, two countries and a long um, time period in which these societies had attempted to confront this difficult legacy. But then when I finished this uh, project and uh, it was published as my first book in 2020, sorry, in 2013, I was at that time sort of um, looking for a new project, for new ideas. And it happened that in late 2012, a friend of mine from Uruguay, who is a survivor of Operation Condor and a survivor of illegal detention and torture in the notorious uh, secret prison called Automotore Sorletti. She sent me a message back then to let me know that her case had finally been included in a trial that was scheduled to begin in Buenos Aires uh, early in 2013. And when she sent me this message, it uh, reminded me of what I had read about uh, Operation Condor during my previous project and um, hearing the excitement, for lack of a better word, uh, of somebody who had been waiting uh, almost 40 years for her case to be investigated by court uh, really caught my attention. And also having studied international relations and human rights, Operation Condor really embodied a number of tensions uh, for me as a scholar in trying to understand why countries that tend to be very jealous of their sovereignty and their territories, and especially in Latin America, would allow agents of other uh, countries from neighboring countries to operate on their territories to hunt down 
the uh, individuals and political opponents that they were after. And so because of these interesting puzzles that Operation Condor uh, raised, I was immediately drawn to this topic. And this is when I decided to build a research project, initially focusing on this trial that did begin on, well, now actually uh, over 10 years ago, because the first hearing was on March 5th, uh, 2013. A very fascinating uh, back, background information. I think our, our listeners will love that. Now, I'll, we, we're affiliated with Latin American Perspectives, and I think a lot of our listeners will probably be aware of Plan Condor or El Sistema Condor. Um, but some of some people might not be. So I'm curious for those of for those of our listeners who are unfamiliar with this history, could you describe what Plan Condor was exactly? Of course, uh, Plan Condor was a secret network that was set up by Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Paraguay, and Uruguay at a specially organized meeting that took place at the end of November 1975 in Santiago, Chile. These countries were a meeting in Santiago, especially um, high-ranking intelligence uh, agents that had been sent from each of these countries to the meeting in Santiago after having received a request uh, and an invitation to participate at this meeting by Colonel Manuel Contreras, who at the time was the director of the uh, National Directorate of Intelligence of Chile, which was a, um, a, a sort of uh, secret police uh, dedicated to the repression of political opposition to the dictatorship headed by General Augusto Pinochet. And so during this meeting in Santiago in late 1975, these countries agreed to establish uh, what they called Sistema Condor in Spanish, although it's much better known as Operation Condor um, in English. And this uh, operation effectively comprised the um, coordination of their policies of political repression across borders, and through these agreements, these countries uh, effectively decided to first uh, share intelligence information about specific individuals and specific members of political parties or revolutionary organizations that they were hoping to detain. And secondly, they also agreed to conduct uh, joint operations. We know that at the same time, uh, inside each of these countries in the context of the uh, governing military regimes, there were uh, operations uh, against political opponents carried out by so-called task forces or Grupo de Tareas. And so uh, through Condor, we see the creation of international uh, task forces because we have the uh, joint collaboration by agents from different countries that traveled across the region to participate in these abduction operations. And uh, in addition, there was also the practice of clandestine renditions that took place uh, as part of uh, these practices of collaborative uh, transnational repression. And there was um, additionally, a uh, new element, uh, I say new because um, we were able to discover the existence of this uh, so-called uh, TESEO unit in the most recent declassification round of US government documents in 2019. And it is through this uh, most recent declassification that the existence of this specific unit um, composed of specially trained agents from Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay uh, was discovered. And these uh, specific uh, task forces uh, were um, scheduled or were tasked with operating outside of South America and carrying out uh, assassination operations, uh, mostly in Europe. I, in your book, you spent some time analyzing 
um, the pre-existing practices of transnational repression that were steadfastly conjured up by the Condor system. Can you talk a little bit about that and um, how important you think this is to know in order to understand how Operation Condor was created and how it functioned? These um, so-called previous uh, practices of collaborations are, in my view, fundamental. And I think uh, hopefully it's one of the novel aspects of the book to try and recover this information. Because as we know, with many of the complex historical and political processes, uh, these do not happen overnight. And so the fact that the five countries that were the five founding countries of Operation Condor were able to set up such a sophisticated system in late 1975 can only be explained with reference to the previous experiences of collaboration that had been unfolding throughout South America uh, since the late 1960s. And so we can see that Operation Condor is, in a sense, the uh, culmination or the apex of these um, ongoing practices and a sort of process of uh, lessons learned and improvement on the practices that had been taking place in the previous years. The focus on these uh, prior experiences is also important because I think it enables us to see uh, the key role of a country that has generally uh, liked to present itself as not being uh, closely linked to Operation Condor. But in fact, uh, we can say that it was one of the intellectual architects of what then became known as Operation Condor. And I'm talking about Brazil here, that by the time that Operation Condor was formalized, was already beginning a slow process of democratic transition. And I think this is why Brazil has liked to portray itself as not uh, equally involved as the other countries in Operation Condor at the time. But if we sort of dig a little bit deeper in the history of these collaborations, we can actually uh, see that many of the early cases of this phenomenon of uh, the cross-border persecution of exiles and dissidents were in fact Brazilian refugees and politicians who have, were living in exile, uh, mostly in Uruguay, but also in Chile and in Argentina. And this makes sense because um, the uh, coup in Brazil took place in 1964, so uh, quite a few years ahead of the coups that we see in, um, in Chile, in Uruguay, or in Bolivia. And many of the exiles, especially many of the political leaders, had fled Brazil and sought uh, refuge in Uruguay and Argentina, and especially also Chile, um, during the presidency of Salvador Allende. And in Brazil, with the sanctioning of Institutional Act Number no. 5 in 1968 that sees a deepening of political repression and the consolidation of torture and disappearances, we see a second wave of many exiles abandoning the country and seeking refuge in neighboring uh, states. And it is also at this time, so um, some of the earliest cases that I could confirm are in fact from 1969, so soon after this deepening of repression in Brazil, where we have um, a number of cases of emblematic Brazilian refugees that are uh, detained, interrogated, tortured, and then returned against their will uh, from Uruguay, from Argentina, and from Chile back to Brazil. And so it is interesting to see how Brazil, in fact, had a leading role in some of these early practices of transnational repression. And it also had a dedicated uh, security agency uh, called CX, the 
Center of uh, Center for Informations uh, Abroad uh, that was in fact uh, dedicated to monitoring all of the exiles, especially in Buenos Aires and in Lisbon and Montevideo that were hotspots of resistance against the Brazilian dictatorship. And also uh, CX agents infiltrated many of the refugees groups in these countries to try and gather information about the different uh, mobilization activities that were taking place. So these initial cases are important in showing how Brazil was in fact uh, not a, a marginalized player in these practices, but in fact one of the, uh, if not the key country that initiated uh, these practices in the late 1960s and the early uh, 1970s. And then we see the role of Brazil actually continuing throughout the decade because Brazil did join uh, Operation Condor in 1976. And there are cases of refugees being abducted in Brazil as late as 1980. I think another important element to emphasize in this early period relates to the September 11th, uh, 1973, 1973 coup in Chile, which is where we can trace the uh, construction of the image of the foreigner uh, as an enemy and as a threat to the national security of the military regimes. And it is emblematic that in the National Stadium of Santiago, there was a specific section called the foreign section where hundreds of foreigners who had been arrested in the immediate days after the September 11th coup were uh, detained and where we see for the first time uh, agents from Brazil, Argentina and Uruguay traveling to Chile to conduct interrogations of these people uh, and to at the same time, also teach uh, Chilean agents uh, uh, their uh, practices and expertise in inverted comma in uh, torture techniques. So I think the um, September 1973 coup in Chile is also an important turning point because of this uh, construction of the image of the foreigner as an enemy, but also because as a result of this uh, coup, thousands of refugees who had been living uh, in Chile uh, for several years under the government of Allende literally crossed the Andes uh, to flee to Argentina. That was uh, by that time, so late 1973, the last remaining democracy in the region. We were discussing the other day at, at um, our meeting, we have like a political education section and the Latin American perspective meetings, which are like five hours long. And we spend all ar around an hour and a half talking about different political issues having to do with the region. And one of our colleagues was attempting to explain um, fascism in uh, Brazil and the phenomenon of Bolsonarismo. And as a, as a way to articulate um, or to explain this phenomenon, our colleague said that there's a, a connection between the history of slavery, colonialism, and extermination of indigenous people with contemporary versions of, of fascism and repression. You mentioned in your book the Cold War, you talk about the Vietnam War. Um, and you talk about Algiers and France. Do you think there's a, um, a direct connection or a connection at least ideologically, politically, historically between these processes and um, Operation Condor? The ideological uh, backdrop against which we see the emergence of Operation Condor. And of course, this is a, a story that begins much earlier because we know that the national security doctrine uh, begins to be articulated in 1950 um, and is the ideological um, background uh, for the global Cold War that then was fought very much locally across different parts of the uh, global south. 
but certainly the national security doctrine is the ideological underpinning for many of the military regimes that uh, slightly later, beginning with Brazil in, 19, in 1964, and then Bolivia, Uruguay, Chile, Argentina, uh, take power across the region and certainly see themselves as participating in this um, third world war in which they are engaged in the um, in a fight against an enemy that is no longer the traditional enemy of the army of other states, but is an internal enemy in the form of uh, so-called, in the language of these militaries, subversives, communists, uh, or any individuals who are perceived to represent as a challenge to the uh, traditional Western and Catholic way of life, but also um, as an opposition to the um, business and economic models that also accompanied the onset of these uh, military uh, regimes as well. So clearly, the national security doctrine is uh, one of the uh, significant lenses that we need to think about when um, considering Operation Condor. Uh, but I would say, and this is something that really came across uh, very clearly to me as part of the hearings that I monitored in Buenos Aires in the uh, Operation Condor trial, uh, because in the case of Argentina and Brazil specifically, we see a very strong influence by the so-called French school of counterinsurgency. And the case of Argentina is quite striking because if my memory doesn't fail me now, um, as early as 1957, uh, one of the first delegations of French generals travels to Argentina uh, to teach in inverted commas. Um, sorry, <laughs> sorry, that was my alarm to connect <laughs> for the call. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll um, resume from the French school. So another important element that came out uh, very clearly, especially in the hearings that I participated in during the Operation Condor trial in Buenos Aires, was the so-called uh, French school of counterinsurgency. And if my memory doesn't fail me now, uh, I think it was as early as 1957 that there was the first visit of a delegation of French generals and military officers that traveled to Buenos Aires to share with the Argentine armed forces their lessons learned and experiences from the uh, struggles in Algeria and in uh, Vietnam. And in particular, the uh, French school um, emphasized a number of concepts that we can see, especially in Argentina, with regard to the division of territory in very specific areas that would be uh, subsequently the basis for the 1976 dictatorship, whereby, of course, political repression was decided at the top, at the commanding level, but then implemented in each of these areas and sub areas very close to the ground level. Another key concept was the idea that the enemy was uh, hiding among the local population. And so uh, this required the use of uh, torture and interrogation in order to identify these levels of collaboration. And also the practice of disappearances itself uh, builds on some of the experiences of the French school. But I also wanted to pick up on something that uh, you, Thomas, mentioned in your, in your question about Brazil, about these colonial legacies, and something that uh, caught my, my attention is one of the torture techniques that was used specifically in Brazil, um, which was called the par parrot's perch. Uh, which was um, a technique that used to be um, uh, adopted in the treatment of slaves uh, during colonial times and was then used subsequently much later as one could say one of the uh, defining uh, torture techniques 
of uh, Brazilian police and military officers. And I understand, and I haven't researched this specifically, but apparently this continues to be used nowadays uh, in, in Brazil in the um, persecution of specifically marginalized uh, groups and marginalized populations in the country. So uh, there seems to be some uh, continuities uh, and I would tend to agree with what your colleague was, was trying to argue in terms of these uh, practices continuing to be reproduced across history. Now, you already, you already started to touch upon this, but before, before we get too far away from it, I, I want to come back to uh, this idea of the role of the United States. And I wanted to just uh, directly ask you, do you think Plan Condor was part of a U.S.-led intelligence operation to suppress any progressive political movements in Latin America? I think that's a very difficult question. And I would say that based on the evidence that we have available at the moment, um, we cannot say either way if that was the case. Um, the evidence that we have uh, enables us to say um, the following conclusions. One of them, which I already mentioned, relates to the ideological underpinnings of the military regimes with the national security doctrine emerging and being directly uh, promoted by the United States all across the Western Hemisphere and beyond. Um, this uh, support of the United States was not only ideological, it was also material. Uh, we know that in parallel to that, the US was providing economic and military assistance to uh, many of the countries of the region assistance that we then know was used in the uh, massive expansion of military and police forces and the use of resources that were then uh, devoted to political repression. And we also know that many of the um, uh, Latin American uh, military and police agents traveled uh, to the uh, infamous uh, School of the Americas to receive trade, uh, to receive training, and um, and to attend courses in so-called uh, counterinsurgency techniques that we know were effectively uh, training courses in torture uh, that were then uh, very much implemented on the ground in each of uh, the countries. We also know that in addition to providing this training at the School of the Americas. Um, U.S. police officers were sent on the ground to train uh, local police and military agents. Uh, I think the case of Dan Mitrione is uh, very well known, the agents of the um, OPS that was sent to Uruguay as early as the mid 1960s to uh, effectively train Uruguayan police officers in um, anti-guerrilla uh, techniques and uh, again torture and interrogation techniques and Mitrione stayed in the country for several several years and he was um, so emblematic of these practices that uh, he was abducted I think in 1970 by uh, the um, uh, members of the Tupamaros liberation movement. So we have a very proactive role of the United States in this type of uh, training of the agents that would then be directly involved in the perpetration of human rights um, atrocities. Um, we also know that the United States provided communications equipment that was uh, used by the countries of the region in their secure communication system that was part of Operation Condor and which is called uh, Condor Tel, and that many of these communications uh, traveled through a communications base in Panama. Um, we also know through uh, many of the declassification rounds that the U.S. possessed a lot of detailed information about what was happening in the region, uh, about Operation Condor. In fact, the term itself, Operation Condor, comes 
from many of the declassified uh, cables from the State Department, from the CIA, and from the FBI, uh, clearly showing how there was a very um, uh, profound knowledge of the dynamics that were taking place in the region. In all of my research, I haven't found any other evidence to indicate that Operation Condor was masterminded by the United States. Uh, my own interpretation uh, or my own inclination is to um, certainly see the United States as providing many useful resources, whether they were uh, technological, communications, economic, military and training. But uh, based on the evidence, I would say that the idea was very much uh, South American and that built also on a longer history of uh, collaboration between the police in, police forces of the region. Um, Diego Galeano, who is an Argentine historian, he has documented in his research how as early as uh, 1905 and 1920, there were uh, um, regional conferences by the uh, police forces of South America in which they began to uh, exchange information and to think about the ways in which they could support each other in, at that time, the um, uh, persecution of the uh, so-called uh, criminals that tended to be in the 1920s, anarchists uh, and members of these movements. So I think uh, saying that this was a that Operation Condor was a CIA operation uh, would remove the agency of South American states who had actually a much longer history in working together uh, against what they perceived to be common enemies. Having said that, I think the various types of support that the US provided were certainly uh, useful and important in making uh, Operation Condor as successful, in inverted commas, as it was, uh, because uh, these uh, South American states benefited from the financial, uh, military, and uh, economic support that they received at the time. Thank you for that, that response. I. Among the many things I found really interesting about your book was that how you you framed that argument. I think there's a tendency uh, we're based here in the United States, and I think there's a tendency here on the left and even in a lot of left wing Latin American studies academic circles to frame the issue of U.S. imperialism, the Cold War as a, a very sort of top down U.S. directing operations or really playing a major role in um, in issues like this in Latin America. But as you show that the, the Latin American nations themselves bear a lot of responsibility as well um, because the, the right in Latin America was doing this with or without the United States' help, but it just was mutually beneficial, which I found I found that argument really, really interesting, as well as, um, I can't remember exactly where in the book, but you show at one point um, the actions taken by the pl uh, Planned Condor governments at certain times weren't within the interests of the United States foreign policy, particularly the, ass the assassination of certain certain actors abroad and uh, how that bothered Henry, Henry Kissinger, and he took action to let foreign governments know that this was taking place. I I had no idea about that history, and I found that really fascinating. Yeah, so I think the in particular the uh, murder of uh, former Chilean ambassador Orlando Letelier and his colleague Ronnie Moffitt at the Institute of Policy Studies that took place in uh, September 1976 in Washington, D.C. I think it is one of these examples where we see that the Latin American countries um, felt so ambitious that they thought that they could carry out a, a terrorist attack effectively in the territory of the United States that at the time, certainly for Pinochet regimes, was one of their <laughs> closest allies. And they also were planning to conduct many more assassinations in Europe through the Teseo unit that I mentioned. And in fact, we know that these Teseo uh, 
agents were on the ground in Paris in December 1976 and that they had to abandon their mission because they were discovered. And I think on the basis of the evidence that we have, they were discovered exactly because by that point, uh, after the Letelier's murder, uh, there was much more awareness of what uh, Operation Condor was, uh, was about. It was not only about the repression beyond borders in the region, but with the potential of spilling over in Europe, in the United States. And this was certainly... Um, something that the United States was not uh, willing to, to tolerate. And in fact, the um, implications of these um, attempted, uh, in the case of the Teseo operations and the uh, murder of Letelier, we see how some of the uh, consequences of the uh, Letelier murder uh, in the United States, in fact, begin to mark a turning point in Operation Condor itself, because it is at this juncture that the United States begins to put pressure and much more pressure on, on Chile in terms of handing over the agents of the DINA that had been uh, involved in the assassination of Letelier and also uh, pushing for the closure of DINA itself, which happens in 1977 and the fall from grace of uh, Manuel Contreras, DINA's director, who had been the organizer of the founding conference in 1975 and had um, effectively come up uh, with the idea of setting up Operation Condor. He's removed as uh, head of the DINA and loses uh, all of the power that he had in, in Chile at the time. So um, these, uh, I would say, overstepping of the line potentially by the Condor countries in thinking that Operation Condor actions could be exported outside of South America uh, signals in a way the beginning of the end of Operation Condor. What role did civilians play in this transnational intelligence apparatus? I'm thinking of ambassadors, consuls, businessmen, politicians, lawyers, journalists, judges. So I, it's a very interesting question. And this is also something that was quite evident in many of the hearings of the trial in Buenos Aires. The fact that, of course, although the armed and security forces were uh, the main institutions that were um, implementing Operation Condor in parallel to the political repression at the domestic level, all of the resources of the state were dedicated to the persecution of the opposition. And this becomes uh, quite evident in the cases of Operation Condor because uh, the network of embassies and diplomatic uh, stations across the world uh, were used as uh, useful um, mechanisms for the monitoring of exiles, for controlling uh, what individuals of interest were doing abroad, the type of uh, denunciations of the military dictatorships they were involved in. And just to give uh, the audience an example, um, Senator uh, Selmar Michelini uh, from Uruguay uh, was a uh, member of the left wing uh, uh, Frente Amplio coalition who left Uruguay uh, just a few hours before the coup took place in June 1973. And he relocated uh, to Buenos Aires, as many Uruguayans who uh, hoped that the dictatorship wouldn't last very long and that they wanted to remain close enough so that they could return home uh, very quickly. From Buenos Aires, uh, Michelini, who was also a journalist, worked in the newspaper uh, La Opinion and was uh, one of the leading figures in the uh, local Uruguayan community, welcoming the refugees that arrived all the time from Montevideo, providing support and different types of assistance, especially when the first few cases of 
abductions of Uruguayans also began to take place in Buenos Aires in 1974. At the same time, because uh, he was a renowned political figure, he was invited uh, to speak at the uh, Russell Tribunal Number no. 2 that took place in Rome in March uh, 1974. The Russell Tribunal was at the time investigating the human rights atrocities that had been taking place in the region. And Senator Michelini gave a very powerful speech in which he outlined the uh, political repression that uh, not only the Tupamaros, but political leaders, trade union leaders, and students were facing with the routine use of torture and the um, imp and imprisonment in the country. La denuncia del popolo uruguayano che viene presentata dal senatore Michelini, una delle più eminenti figure dell'emigrazione uruguayana. La parola al senatore Michelini. Señores miembros del Tribunal Russell, señoras y señores, Uruguay es un país pequeño, sin grandes riquezas naturales ni valores estratégicos. Su pueblo se formó sobre la base de una importante inmigración española e italiana que le permitió constituirse al cabo de más de 100 años de vida, en un país de trabajo, de gente sencilla, cordial, acogedora, cuyo mayor orgullo era su estabilidad institucional, su culto a la libertad, el respeto al hombre y a los derechos inherentes a su persona. En una América convulsionada, permanentemente herida por los avatares de un destino trágico, presentaba una imagen de paz, de concordia, de tolerancia. Durante los últimos 40 años, contrastando muchas veces con la vida de los países hermanos, su vida se desarrolló normalmente. El pueblo convocado a las elecciones designaba a sus autoridades y eran estas, legítimamente constituidas, las que orientaban al país. Agrupaciones políticas distintas, con ideología muchas veces enfrentadas, dirimían ante el juez supremo de la opinión pública sus diferencias conceptuales. Desde hace unos años, primero lentamente, y luego con ritmo de vértigo, todo eso se fue perdiendo. El último mes del año 1967 marca lo que podríamos denominar el inicio del fin, aunque la tragedia hubiese comenzado mucho antes como lo demostraremos en el memorándum presentado ante este tribunal y del cual daremos cuenta en la jornada del 4 de abril. And as soon as he returns from that trip to Buenos Aires, uh, Senator Michelini begins to receive the threats and um, there is a Uruguayan policeman who is effectively stationed in Argentina at the time to keep an eye on the uh, community of exiles and also on Senator uh, Michelini. Many of the communications from the embassy uh, in Buenos Aires back to Montevideo relate uh, what Michelini was doing, what other politicians were also doing during their exile, and also um, deny many of their requests for the renewal of passports, which in the case of Michelini effectively sealed his fate because uh, the lack of renewal of his passport meant he couldn't travel abroad. He also didn't want to leave. Uh, he wanted to stay in Buenos Aires. Um, but this uh, uh, cancelling of his passport effectively meant that he could be one of the targets of uh, one of the Condor operations in later years. But it's quite striking to see the number of communications between the embassy and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs each time Michelini tried to carry out different administrative tasks relating to his, uh, his time in, in Buenos Aires and how the uh, embassy effectively was using these as a way to, to con as a way to control what exiles were doing 
In addition, uh, we also had the military attaches of the embassies that uh, also played key roles in um, monitoring the groups of exiles, in keeping an eye on any of the activities. And in fact, subsequently at the time when Operation Condor is in, in full swing, we know that military attaches also participate in some of the actual abduction operations. Um, another interesting element in the case of Condor relates to the role of uh, border agencies, uh, because there were many uh, clandestine renditions, uh, especially through flights, but also through um, uh, people being, uh, especially from Argentina to Uruguay, being transferred in small boats, um, in the uh, northern part of the uh, river plate, which can be crossed uh, quite easily. And so a level of uh, complicity and participation even by these agencies that uh, were not directly involved in the repressive act, but by closing an eye to these clandestine renditions of prisoners uh, did become accomplices in these, in these crimes. Uh, with specifically on businesses, I haven't found any information uh, regarding Operation Condor, but undoubtedly um, in this broader context of military dictatorships that um, also uh, adopted a very specific uh, view of the economic structure and the economic policies that needed to be adopted in the countries of the region, we know that uh, many businesses uh, benefited from the policies that the military regimes implemented. And in many uh, cases, such as in uh, Ford, uh, Volkswagen and other uh, companies, we know that in some of their premises uh, even functioned uh, detention centers and interrogation centers. So we have many different levels of responsibility and complicity depending on the, the businesses. But clearly, uh, there was an interest, especially in targeting the uh, trade union groups and the mobilizations uh, within some of these uh, business actors. You're listening to Editor's Choice, Latin American Perspectives Book Conversations. Today, we're talking with Francesca Lessa about her new book, The Condor Trials, Transnational Repression and Human Rights in South America. Now... I want to talk a little bit about about the book itself. And for me, one of the most striking things or one of the most striking aspects of the book is how much time you dedicate to telling some of these painful and, to put it frankly, horrific stories of repression and persecution and torture. And I'm just curious, of the dozens of cases you encountered and came to know, was there one case that you feel impacted you the most or impacted you a great deal as a researcher and observer of state terrorism? So that's a very hard question <laughs> uh, because I would say that all of the cases were um, very um, emotional and challenging to, uh, to investigate and to analyze. Um, I would say that maybe there are two cases that somehow uh, resonated with me more, um, more than others. Um, one is potentially because it also has a connection to Italy, which is where I'm from originally. And so it sort of shows the wide ranging implications of these uh, crimes. And also it's one of the early cases of uh, transnational repression before the official creation of Operation Condor. So I felt it was particularly significant of that uh, because it clearly showed how some of these practices were already taking place at the time. And this uh, case relates to the um, assassination of uh, three um, Uruguayan exiles in Buenos Aires, um, Daniel Banfi, Luis Latronica, and Guillermo Javif. Um, they had been living in Buenos Aires for some time, 
and I was able to interview uh, the widow of Daniel Bamfi um, as one of the early cases that I investigated for this project. And Aurora uh, Meloni was very generous with her time and in telling the story because um, for herself, she effectively became one of the early um, uh, wives uh, who had to embark on the uh, challenging journey of looking for her uh, missing husband who had taken away in the middle of the night in September 1974. And alongside, uh, she was also looking for the other uh, members of this group because on that evening, in fact, five Uruguayan exiles who were friends and work together were abducted as part of the same operation. And um, Aurora, in fact, uh, was also working closely with Selmar Michelini uh, that I mentioned before, because she turned to him in search of advice and what to do uh, in this early case of a disappearance when in 1974, this was well before the creation of the Madres and the Abuelas groups. So for Aurora, it was a very lonely uh, experience of not to know uh, what to do and wanting to do as much as possible to try to find out what had happened to, to her husband. And so following some of the advice of uh, Senator Michelini, Aurora organizes a press conference. She files habeas corpus. She uh, goes to the Italian embassy. She even goes to the uh, Casa Rosada to have a meeting with one of the um, uh, generals uh, that um, uh, received her on behalf of Isabelita Peron at the time. So she literally begins a journey that then during the Argentine dictatorship, we will see thousands of other families having to do in their a desperate search to find any leads to find out what happened to, to their loved ones. And she uh, faced this journey alongside uh, some of the relatives of the other uh, missing uh, men. And um, they have a moment of hope because two uh, of the five men were released after uh, almost a month after the abduction. Uh, but then two weeks later, they receive uh, the news that three bodies had been found in the outskirts of Buenos Aires, and they it were the bodies of uh, Daniel, Luis, and Guillermo. And this story um, was very powerful because to me, because then Aurora uh, flees to Sweden and then to Italy because her family was... Uh, originally from Italy, and that's where she has been ever since. And she has been uh, fighting for uh, decades to obtain uh, truth and justice for her husband's case. And she was, in fact, one of the six women that in 1995 filed the uh, legal case in Rome that gave rise to the Italian Operation Condor trial. So I think this case is quite em emblematic of the sort of uh, trans even uh, further uh, ramifications of Operation Condor uh, with the use of uh, courts in Europe uh, as um, avenues to obtain uh, justice after a long time. And the other case uh, that I want to mention briefly is the case that opens and closes the book and is the story of two Uruguayan brothers, Anatole, who was four years old, and Victoria, who was 19 months old in 1976, who were also uh, victims of Operation Condor, and whose story spans three countries from Argentina, where they were initially abducted with their parents, to Uruguay, where they were taken, and finally, to Chile, where they were abandoned in, in the O'Higgins Square of the port city of Valparaiso. So this case is also emblematic because it really shows the geographical reach of Operation Condor and what this uh, transnational network enabled uh, the military dictatorships to do to move 
people around across three countries with complete impunity and with the complete uh, uh, support of all the state resources that were used to implement this policy of transnational terror. Now, you you began to touch upon this um, earlier in the interview, but I, I want to return to um, the end of the Condor system. And could you explain what led to it, to the shutdown of the Condor system? What processes or events led to this? So there were a number of interrelated uh, dynamics that help explain why we see the uh, dismantling of Operation Condor in the late uh, 1970s. Um, One of them, which I briefly mentioned already, relates to the uh, pressure that was put by the United States, in particular on Chile, as a consequence of the Letelier murder, and the subsequent closure of the DINA. The DINA had been one of the key um, actors in Operation Condor, which from the very early days of its creation in 1973, had a branch called DINA Exterior that was dedicated to the persecution of exiles, of Chilean exiles outside of the country. So the closure of the DINA, which had been such an important player in transnational repression and Operation Condor has a a key impact in the dynamics in the region. There is another interrelated factor, which is that by uh, 1978, we see that the harmony uh, that we could say that existed between the countries of the region begins to fall apart, in particular, there is a return to traditional animosities between Argentina and Chile at this time uh, because of the uh, situation in the Beagle Channel and the reopening of an old dispute on the exact demarcation of this border in the south of the continent. And this episode uh, brings both countries almost to the brink of a regular war, uh, a traditional armed conflict, which was averted thanks to the mediation of the Pope. But um, it is interesting to see in some of the declassified US government uh, documents how the possibility of a traditional armed conflict uh, generates a a switch in the mind of many of the military members that move away from the uh, previous focus on the internal repression and begin to prepare for a more traditional armed uh, confrontation. So uh, this is significant also because Argentina and Chile had been the two main countries in Operation Condor that had sustained this collaboration and had been the key uh, architects. And so the fact that the two main pillars were about to go to war with each other has clear implications for Operation Condor to the point that in one of the uh, declassified State Department cables, um, we can read that in one of the regular meetings of the intelligence agencies of the time, uh, they had to organize the meetings in a way that the Argentine and Chilean officers never met because they were always ending up fighting, even in those occasions, about the Beagle uh, dispute. Um, There is also another element that I think is important is that by this point in the late 1970s, the policies of both uh, uh, domestic repression and transnational repressions had been quite successful. And so the threat or the perceived threat by uh, mobilized opposition, whether domestic or uh, outside of the countries, was not as present or as not as active as before. And so in a way, Operation Condor had served its purpose. It had been successful in neutralizing uh, the perceived threat that the military dictatorships uh, had sensed in the mid 1970s. And so all of this combination of factors contributes to 
the dismantling of condor. But I think in the same way as condor didn't begin overnight, also condor doesn't, doesn't end overnight. And many of the structures and the channels that had been so successful in, uh, in the persecution of dissidents abroad continued to be used by those countries that still perceived to have an existential threat. And this is particularly the case with Argentina in the early, uh, in the late and early 1970s in the context of the so-called contraoffensiva uh, of the Montoneros military group, and uh, sorry, of the Montonero revolutionary group. And it, we see at this time how Argentina engages on a bilateral level with some of the members of Operation Condor, uh, whether it's Brazil, whether it's Peru or Paraguay, and they use the channels of information exchange and also uh, the possibility of sending agents to those countries to abduct the individuals that they had been able to track and knew that they were on their way back to Argentina. What were some of the most successful strategies put into practice in countries victimized by Operation Condors by what you call justice seekers? What lessons can we learn about the efforts to challenge impunity and prosecute human rights abusers? So there were a number of strategies that uh, justice seekers uh, adopted over time. And again, I think it's useful to look back in time because I feel that sometimes there is um, a perception in the literature that many of the achievements uh, took place uh, with the return of democracy of the region, which is, of course, uh, part of the story. But I think it's um, also important to uh, recover some of the early and very brave efforts of the justice seekers that even at the very peak of uh, the Condor years and the times of the military dictatorships uh, denounced these atrocities that uh, strived to gather evidence and uh, document uh, the crimes that had been committed and as early as 1976, 1977, and uh, 1978, uh, travel to the um, to London, to Amnesty International, to the U.S. Congress, uh, to the United Nations, to present some of the evidence that they had been able to gather to try and shed light on. Uh, what they didn't know was called Operation Condor at the time, but they could perceive that something different to the domestic repression was also going on at the same time. And so some of these early efforts are especially significant in uh, gathering all of the evidence that would then be used by many of the uh, subsequent efforts when democracy returned to the region and, of course, opened up a larger number of opportunities uh, to seek uh, justice. In terms of the strategies, um, there are a number of them. And in the book, I focus specifically on the strategic use of uh, criminal courts as a way to try and achieve justice for Operation Condor, but also using these crimes as a way to effectively um, challenge impunity as a whole in the Southern Cone. Because um, at the time of the transition, we see that on the one hand, some military regimes, such as Brazil's and Chile's, uh, decree amnesty laws uh, to grant uh, impunity for the crimes that were committed. And on the other, we also have democratic parliaments uh, in Argentina and in Uruguay that in response to pressure by the military institution, then sanction impunity laws to protect members of the military and police forces from investigation. And it is in this context of fragile democracies that are trying to strike a difficult balance between consolidating uh, the transition and preventing the potential return of the armed forces, 
and the demands of truth and justice by victims and survivors and the broader society that justice seekers play a number of roles in denouncing these crimes, even during uh, democratic times, and also in trying to be extremely creative uh, in the legal strategies that uh, they adopt. They had, of course, the important precedent of the trial of the military juntas in Argentina in 1985 as a turning point in terms of demonstrating what could be achieved uh, through the use of criminal courts. Um, and building on this, we see how many of the emblematic uh, human rights groups, including the Abuelas, the Plaza de Mayo, the Center for uh, Legal and Social Studies in Argentina, but also many of the groups in Uruguay, in Chile, in Paraguay, and other neighboring countries, they um, begin to try and identify a number of crimes that can be used as strategic tools to challenge the situation of impunity that existed across the Southern Cone in the 1990s. And in this context, we have two um, um, strategies that are quite significant. The first one is the attempt to file uh, criminal cases inside the region, despite the existence of these impunity laws, but by identifying some specific crimes that were not covered by these laws. One of these crimes is the crimes of uh, stealing of babies and children that, uh, especially in Argentina, had been, thanks to the lobbying by the Abuelas, the Plaza de Mayo, had been excluded from the text of the amnesty. It says specifically in the uh, impunity laws of Argentina that these laws do not apply to the cases of stolen babies. And so human rights groups can push uh, through this loophole to say, we need to investigate uh, these cases. In addition to the crime of uh, baby kidnapping, Operation Condor crimes also offer another loophole, which is used strategically by justice seekers. And this is because the crimes of Operation Condor were very often committed in the territory of two or more countries. And because of this crossing of the borders and the fact that a crime had, be, had maybe begun in Argentina and then continued in Uruguay or began in Argentina and continued in Chile, enabled justice seekers to argue that these crimes could not be covered by impunity laws because the scope of these laws was only territorial. And so in the case of Uruguay, for example, we see judges accepting this argument and beginning to investigate the abduction of Uruguayan citizens who had disappeared in Argentina. And so in this sense, um, the crimes of Operation Condor could be used strategically to put pressure on courts and set precedent of investigations going ahead. In the case of Uruguay, in fact, the very first sentence against eight police and military officers happens in 2009 on uh, in a case regarding the murder of 28 Uruguayan exiles in Buenos Aires. So they are successful cases, which then also contribute to opening up a broader investigations, because if some cases go ahead, they were able to generate the momentum for the broader investigation of uh, many of the other crimes. And then the second strategy that also emerged from this context of impunity is the fact that some of the relatives decided to use the courts of Europe to uh, also begin investigations because of the large number of um, victims that had double nationalities because of the many waves of migration from Spain, from Italy, from France to South America, many of the relatives could use the courts of those countries in trying to achieve justice. And this is effectively the, the history of the Italian Operation Condor trial, where we have 
a large number of victims from Uruguay where the uh, Ley de Caducidad was unbreakable for many years. And because of this, uh, justice seekers decided to use the courts in Rome as a way to at least be able to investigate uh, the crimes that their relatives had been uh, victims of. A partir de ese juicio y de la condena que propugno, nos cabe la responsabilidad de fundar una paz basada no en el olvido, sino en la memoria, no en la violencia, sino en la justicia. Esta es nuestra oportunidad y quizá sea la última. Por estas consideraciones, acuso a los aquí procesados por los delitos que han sido objeto de calificación y solicito que al fallar en definitiva se los condene a las siguientes penas. Jorge Rafael Videla, reclusión perpetua con la más la accesoria del artículo 52 del Código Penal. Emilio Eduardo Macera, reclusión perpetua con más la accesoria del artículo 52 del Código Penal. Orlando Ramón Agosti, reclusión perpetua con más la accesoria del artículo 52 del Código Penal. Roberto Eduardo Viola, reclusión perpetua. Armando Lambruschini, reclusión perpetua. Leopoldo Fortunato Galtieri, 15 años de prisión. Omar Rubén Grafiña, 15 años de prisión. Jorge Isaac Anaya, 12 años de prisión. Basilio Lamidoso, 10 años de prisión, para todos con accesorias legales y costas. Señores jueces, quiero renunciar expresamente a toda pretensión de originalidad para cerrar esta requisitoria. Quiero utilizar una frase que no me pertenece, porque pertenece ya a todo el pueblo argentino. Señores jueces, nunca más. Silencio en la sala. Silencio. The recent premiere of Argentina 1985, an Oscar-nominated film that dramatizes the challenges of organizing the trial against the head of the military dictatorship in Argentina, has generated a burst of discussion on the importance of legal proceedings against perpetrators of human rights abuses. We're, cu- we're both curious if you've seen the film, and if you have, how do you think it connects with the history you delve into in your book? So I, I watched the movie. I was actually uh, in Buenos Aires the day it was released. So with uh, friends, we had booked tickets <laughs> in advance to make sure that we could watch it uh, that same evening. It was a very uh, powerful experience to be uh, watching it in Buenos Aires and to see through uh, the the movie itself uh, so many feelings of uh, people uh, crying, uh, so many emotions and uh, the clapping at the end uh, of the movie um, to uh, sort of, I think, I don't know if celebrate is the right word, but to, I think, at least applaud the uh, major efforts that had taken place at a point in time in which impunity uh, and the sort of turning of the page on the past used to be the norm. Um, so this movie was very powerful and um, I, f- at least in my view, I feel it's directly uh, connected to the Operation Condor uh, story and the Operation Condor trials that I discuss in my book. And again, I'm going to mention the the Condor trial that I witnessed in Argentina. I spent uh, so much time in the courtroom there. And it was um, very powerful to see uh, two dynamics that are closely related to to the movie. The first one is that the sentence that was dictated in 1985 is, I would say, the building block of the entire Um, system of accountability in Argentina, because as early as 1985, the uh, judges recognize the what they call in Argentina, the plan sistematico, the systematic implementation of a policy of disappearances that took place on a national scale with the same modus operandi, uh, with the same level 
of resources by the state all across the country. And it was uh, interesting for me to see during the Argentine Condor trial how uh, this sentence, uh, number 1384, I've listened to it so many times that I don't think I will ever forget it, was mentioned so frequently during the trial um, to prove how uh, the objective of the specific Condor trial at this point only related to, show, to showing how those victims were part of this bigger plan that had taken place in Argentina. And it was interesting to see how there was no more discussion about the systematic repression that had happened in the country, how that sentence um, so early on had uh, basically laid the ground for uh, this um, this understanding of the repression that had taken place in the country. And then the story of the other victims all relate to this bigger plan that had taken place um, in, in the country. So it was, in my experience, very closely related because Operation Condor was then linked to the systematic practices that had been taking place uh, in Argentina in terms of disappearances and which have a direct impact on Operation Condor. The vast majority of the crimes, about um, almost 70% of the crimes of Operation Condor take place in Argentina because this is where thousands of exiles were living by 1976. And so of course, the modus operandi of disappearances that is taking place in Argentina also has an impact on the cases of Operation Condor that took place there. And then the second element that is also related to the movie um, regards the fact of uh, the importance of the CONADEP Truth Commission investigation that is also the starting point uh, for the uh, public prosecutor office to uh, build their, their case. And I clearly remember that for each of the victims of the Condor trial, um, the public prosecution would begin by mentioning what the CONADEP had determined about each of the victims. And again, that was very powerful to see how these two historic landmarks of the CONADEP report and the uh, trial of the military juntas permeated the entire uh, Condor trial and how the information that had been gathered several decades before was instrumental uh, for the uh, construction of the Operation Condor trial as well. Bueno, un día importante, 24 de marzo, muchísima juventud vemos en esta convocatoria. Sí, mucha juventud para mí está en la juventud, prendió y es, está una Argentina con memoria, verdad y justicia. Me parece que tenemos que reivindicar, tenemos que mostrar eso. Hay cuadras, cuadras y cuadras de jóvenes hoy a la plaza también van a ir muchísimos, muchísimas familias, much, muchísimos pibes, muchísimas pibas. Hay que reivindicar eso. In Argentina, March 24th is the National Day of Remembrance for Truth and Justice. Hundreds of thousands of people in a couple of days will march towards Plaza de Mayo to memorize the victims and the assault on democracy. What do you think of these types of events? How important do you think they are to educate younger generations about the atrocities committed in the past? This uh, type of events and the uh, commemoration of uh, specific uh, symbolic days such as March 24th, but there are um, also many other uh, different dates, September 11th in Chile and May 20th in, in Uruguay, they are uh, fundamental uh, processes of memory construction and commemoration. And in particular, they play a key role in setting the uh, grounds for the guarantees of a non-repetition uh, in trying to ensure that uh, never again, as the famous title of the CONADEP report is called, that never again, uh, neither in South America or elsewhere, uh, we should witness uh, this type of atrocities.
sometimes um, when these crimes are committed, there is a perception that this is a story about the direct victims or maybe their relatives and the close circle of their families. And although, while well, of course, they were the direct victims of the atrocities and the persecution, um, this was also, there was also a broader uh, victim that was society. These commemorations are uh, fundamental because um, there is sometimes the perception that when these atrocities take place, this only relates to the direct victims or their close relatives and the circle of people that is nearest to them. However, uh, while it is of course true that they have uh, lived more directly this phenomenon, um, there is a broader element of responsibility and that there is a broader group of individuals that have also been affected. And this regards society. As we know, uh, during these uh, practices of state terror, it is in fact part of the policy that um, there is a smaller group of victims, but what happens to them is an example in the process of social control and social discipline, disciplining um, of the rest of the population. By knowing what happened to uh, people who have disappeared, one can fear for himself or herself and refrain from a certain type of behavior in the attempt to protect one's life. And so there is um, a number of levels in which state terrorism operate, of course, the direct level of the victims, but also the indirect level of society that is nonetheless affected by these practices and that is also uh, affected by the broader process of the restriction of civil liberties, of restrictions of freedom of expression, of mobilization, and being able to be politically active or participate in trade unions, censorship, the intervention of schools and universities. And so if we only um, understood this phenomenon as affecting the direct victims, we would be missing an important element of state terror and the significance of the social control and the uh, social disciplining of the rest of the population. And it, it is in this light that these commemorative events are especially important because um, it is part of uh, all of us as uh, citizens of various countries to make sure that the conditions that lead to the um, onset of political repression, to the onset of autocratic regimes, and to the onset of uh, practices of state terror, that we all are aware of uh, what can happen and that we all, uh, in our own context, try to always be alert and to always be attentive to any potential restrictions and curtailing of human rights and civil liberties, and that we understand that um, we need to work together uh, towards this task and to really make sure that uh, the uh, events that can lead to this type of atrocities do not take place again. And I think these events are also important because uh, they create a sort of, if uh, we can say this, a uh, puente de la memoria, a memory bridge, uh, because the other perception is that sometimes once uh, the people who live through these times will pass away, these issues uh, will also go away. But we also know from history, from the case of Spain in particular, that uh, this is not the case. In fact, the uh, intergenerational uh, trauma continues to live on and that the, the grandchildren and great grandchildren of the victims continue to mobilize and to continue to want to know the truth about the atrocities committed. And so it is important through these events to also open up the circle of uh, justice seekers so that when the abuelas or the madres who are unfortunately passing away because these events are quite uh, far in history by now, 
there are members of the younger generations that uh, maybe didn't live through the dictatorship, didn't even live through the first democratic years, but were born much more recently, understand that that's a shared history and that uh, it's a history that they need to, to know and that they need to work as part of their daily lives in trying to prevent the recurrence of these uh, events in the future. So uh, I was in Buenos Aires on March 24th, uh, a few years back, and it is uh, really um, impressive to see the number of people that participate in these commemorations of all ages, from the abuelas to uh, children and teenagers uh, that go there with their uh, families as part of this effort of uh, creating Puentes de la Memoria that can uh, help uh, try to achieve this uh, horizon of the never again in Argentina and beyond. Well, thank you so much, uh, Francesca, for, for your time and for your great responses. Uh, we really enjoy reading the book. We think it's a great contribution to human rights research in, in Latin America and, and beyond, as you said, in many of your answers. Yeah, and we hope that this podcast will help get the book out there to people in the English-speaking world, but also we have some outreach in, throughout Latin America as well. So we, we hope we can do our part to help spread this awesome work. Thank you so much. And maybe I can just add that the book is also available in Spanish. So if anyone prefers to read it in Spanish, um, it's available and it's called Los Juicios del Condor. That is all the time we have for today, but thanks for listening in. The Condor Trials is available for purchase at YaleUniversityPress.com. Check the show notes for where you can order a copy and how you can get in contact with us here at Latin American Perspectives. If you like the show and would like to receive updates about new episodes or content from our journal, be sure to subscribe to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your preferred listening app. And follow our journal on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And please don't forget to rate the show and listen in to our next episode. Gracias. Hasta la próxima. Thank you.